In this lecture, we're going to look at the muscular system. Skeletal muscles cause movement by exerting force on tendons, which pull on bones or other structures. Now, articulating bones usually don't move equally in response to the contraction. Now, the attachment of a tendon to the stationary bone is called the origin. The attachment to the muscle's other tendon to the movable bone is called the insertion. And we can see that here with the biceps brachii muscle. We see the, the tendons up here at the top attaching to the coracoid process in the supraglenoid tubercle. Now, if you flex your arm to make a muscle, you're going to notice that the shoulder does not move. So that is going to be the origin. But as you're flexing your muscle, you're going to notice that your forearm is going to flex. And so that's the movable region. And so down here is going to be the insertion on the radius. And then the action of the muscle is the main movement that occurs during contraction. Uh, we were just talking about flexion. If we wanted to go the opposite direction, we would talk about extension. And we can see the um, triceps muscle right here and its origin and insertion. Other actions might be adduction and abduction or pronation and supination, for example. Now, lever systems. A lever is a rigid structure that can move around a fixed point called a fulcrum. And a lever is acted on at two points um, by different forces. So again, a lever is acted upon at two different points by two different forces. We have the effort, which causes the movement, and we have the load or resistance, which opposes the movement. Now, the effort is the force due to muscular contraction. The load is the weight uh, that is moved or some resistance, an object uh, to being moved. For example, the weight of a book has to be overcome before you can actually pick it up. And the motion occurs when the effort is applied to the bone at the insertion exceeds the load. So in other words, if what you're picking up is 10 pounds, then the effort has to exceed 10 pounds in order to move that object. Now there's three types of levers and they differ on the position of the fulcrum, the effort, and the load. We have first class levers. They're not that common. The fulcrum is between the effort and the load. And I'll show you examples of pictures in just a moment. A second class lever is also uncommon. The load is between the fulcrum and the effort. And then finally we have third class levers. These are very common. These are the most common actually. And the effort is between the fulcrum and the load. And here's some examples of classes of levers. As you can see in the first class lever, the fulcrum is between the effort and load just like a seesaw or teeter-totter, or anatomically, head movement. The second class lever, the load is between the fulcrum and the effort, just like in a wheelbarrow, or standing up on the ball of your foot. And the third class lever, uh, the effort is located between the fulcrum and the load, and this would be an example of a person using a shovel where the fulcrum is backed by the handle. The shaft of the shovel is where the effort is applied and the load is on the end. Now this is the most common type of lever, the third class lever. Looking at the effects of muscle fascicle arrangement, all muscle fibers are parallel to one another within a single fascicle. Fascicles, however, can form patterns with respect to the tendons. 
we can have a parallel shape or pattern, a fusiform shape or pattern, a circular shape, a triangular shape, or a pennate shape. Now, pennate, interesting word. Um, what comes to my mind is the time when my, my dog ate my pen, a very expensive pen, actually, a Mont Blanc. Uh, but let's look at that word for a second. Um, think about colonial times. What did they use as a pen? Well, if we look at the Latin derivation of penate, which is penatus, which means feathered or winged. And in the old days, they used to use feather pens. So I want you to keep that in mind. Penate means feathered. And so if we look here at these muscle uh, shapes, we can see this one that looks like a uh, feather with half of the, the uh, barbs stripped off. And um, this would be called a unipennate muscle. And the tendon here would be like the shaft of the feather. And again, the muscle fibers themselves would be like the barbs or vein of a feather. And since it's on one side, again, we call it unipennate. If it's on both sides, we call it bipennate. And here we can have um, multipennate. And multipennate is a muscle with several tendons of origin and several tendons of insertion in which the fibers pass obliquely from a tendon of origin to a tendon of insertion on each side. And they can come together uh, down to one tendon. And we would consider a muscle like that a convergent muscle. And some other shapes uh, that we mentioned are parallel muscles or circular muscles. Let's take a look at some other muscle shapes. And some of these shapes are how we might even name muscles. For instance, this one right here, the quadrangular muscle, I'm thinking of like quadratus femoris, for instance, or pronator quadratus muscle. It would be this shape. Or the trapezoidal muscle. Any guess what muscle would be trapezoidal? How about the trapezius? Down here we have the rhomboidal muscle. So the rhomboids would be an example. This triangular muscle here, this is an upside down delta. So the deltoid muscle would be this triangular shape. Other muscles might take on this fusiform shape. And if we take a look at this muscle, this muscle has two bellies. And so di means two. Gastric refers to the bellies. So this muscle has two bellies, or is digastric. Whereas this muscle has two heads. And so we call it bicipital. Now these heads act as origins. Now this is important for a test, because in the test it might refer to heads, or it might refer to origins. So just remember that. So we can have the bicipital muscle, we can have the tricipital muscle, again it has triceps. Quadriceps muscle has four heads. And again, interchange the, the term heads with origins. Now muscles are named according to a number of different things. One, it could be named by location, such as pectoralis, which is in the chest. Gluteus, well, you know where your gluteus maximus is, correct? Or brachial, meaning arm. It could be referred to by size, maximus, minimus, longest, or brevis. Brevis means short. Think of brief, or brevity is being short, such as in time. It could be named after the shape, deltoid, quadratus, teres. And when we say teres, 
Terry's means round, but don't think like a circle. Think more of a cylinder, more cylindrical. An example, I guess, of a cylinder would be like the markers I use to write on the, the whiteboard. That would be cylindrical. So if a muscle is called teres, or even a tendon called teres, you know it's going to be long and cylindrical. Or it might refer to orientation, such as rectus. Rectus means straight. I know what you're thinking. Rectus sounds like rectum. Rectum is a straight, up and down piece of large intestine, basically. We could also name a muscle according to origin and insertion like the sternocleidomastoid, which sounds like a huge word, but if we take it apart, we can see that uh, this muscle is going to attach from the sternum. Clido refers to the clavicle, and then it goes up and attaches behind the ear at the mastoid process. So that's the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Or the brachioradialis. Brachial Brachio refers to brachial, the arm. Radialis refers to the bone in the forearm, the radius. And so that's our origin insertion. Again, the number of heads or origins, biceps, triceps, quadriceps, etc. Or we could refer to the function, like abductor. If someone is abducted, what happens to them? They get taken away. So abduction is moving away from the midline of the body. So an abductor muscle would move that part of the body away from the midline. Adductor, think about adding it back toward the midline. So some muscles are adductors. And then um, masseter, mastication is chewing. And the masseter is one of your main chewing muscles. Now the effects of muscle fascicle arrangement. Muscle fascicles have a compromise that they have to make. They must compromise between power and range of motion. The longer the fibers in a muscle, the greater the range of motion it can, it can have. The power of a muscle depends not on its length, but on its total cross-sectional area. So what does that mean? So in other words, a long skinny muscle is not gonna be as powerful as maybe a short fat muscle. What's making that muscle fat? What's giving it a large cross-sectional um, diameter? Well, the fact that inside that muscle are going to be lots of uh, basically sliding filaments myofibrils that contain those thick and thin filaments. The more of those you have, the stronger the muscle is going to be. And then coordination among muscles. It's common to attribute a specific action at a joint to a single muscle bundle, but remember that muscles don't work in isolation. Movements usually result from several skeletal muscles acting as a group. Most skeletal muscles are arranged in opposing or antagonistic pairs at joints, such as flexors versus extensors, etc. In an opposing muscle pair, one is called the prime mover or agonist and is responsible for the action, while the other muscle is called the antagonist. This stretches and yields to the effects of the agonist. An example would be, again, if I'm going to flex my arm, my biceps brachii muscle is going to be the prime mover or agonist. Its antagonist is the triceps. Now what if I want to straighten my arm? When I straighten my arm, the prime mover or agonist is the triceps muscle. Its antagonist is going to be the biceps. Now, coordination among muscles to prevent unwanted movements at other joints or to otherwise aid the movement of the agonist, muscles called synergists contract and stabilize the intermediate joint. 
Other muscles act as fixators, stabilizing the origin of the agonist so that the agonist is more efficient. So depending on the movement required, many muscles may act as prime movers, antagonists, synergists, or fixators. Which brings us to the next question. What would be um, better for building muscle? Would it be machines or free weights? Well, machines tend to isolate muscle groups, whereas free weights, in order to stabilize the, that uh, bar, you're going to have to call on your fixators and stabilizers. And some general principles and review. Tendons, again, attach muscles to bones as opposed to ligaments, which attach bone to bone. Now, an aponeurosis is a very broad tendon. An example would be the tendon that attaches the frontalis muscle on the skull to the occipitalis muscle. And we have a couple of names for that. The old term is the galea aponeurotica, or the newer term is the epicranial aponeurosis. Now, muscles, uh, again, we have origins or heads. It's the muscle end attached to the more stationary of the two bones. Again, the insertion is the muscle end attached to bone with the greatest movement. The belly is the largest portion of the muscle between origin and insertion. And then synergists are muscles that work together to cause a movement. Again, a prime mover plays a major role in accomplishing movement. An agonist is a muscle causing an action when it contracts. The antagonist is a muscle working in opposition of the agonist. And fixators stabilize joints uh, crossed by the prime mover.